We now continue our journey in the world of uh, cross-border payments. And the next speaker is Gregory Vincent from Stonex. He is the head of uh, uh, foreign exchange for payments for Europe, uh, Middle East, Africa at Stonex. Stonex has developed a procedure that rationalizes uh, correspondent banking uh, in order to facilitate payments in almost uh, any country. Stonex is relevant in our discussion on uh, collaboration between the private and, uh, and the public sector because Stonex is in frequent dialogue with a lot of central banks in developing countries in order to find the best way to address uh, payments in that country. Uh, Stonex is not very well known perhaps for the moment, but it is extremely used in fact for uh, making cross-border payments in uh, uh, currencies which are not easily accessible. And uh, some central banks uh, in, the developing in the developed world are using uh, Stonex directly. Others may be using it indirectly without knowing it because they use a, a provider which itself is probably using Stonex. So Gregory, the floor is yours. Jean-Michel, many thanks for that very generous introduction and many thanks to the team at Currency Research for giving Stonex an opportunity to present again at the uh, Central Bank Payments Conference. Um, Jens, I don't know if you can... Perfect. Thank you very much for bringing up our, our, our slides. Um, so my name's Gregory Vincent. I work for Stonex Global Payments, part of the, the Stonex um, Group Inc which is a, a NASDAQ listed financial services firm. And um, Jens, if we could scroll through to the first substantive, thank you very much. So um, obviously, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're honored to have an opportunity to present once again at the, uh, the Central Bank Payments Conference. Um, and this morning we were um, asked to talk about cross-border uh, payments, new initiatives. Um, and there, there are really four points I want to touch on. So firstly, for the audience, I'd like to introduce who, who Stonex Global Payments are. I mean, as I as I referenced just before, this is not our first time presenting at the, the um, Central Bank Payments Conference. Hopefully some participants will remember us from a couple of years ago in person in Berlin, where Marcus Renkus from Deutsche Bank very generously co-presented with our global head, Carson Hills, talking about the partnership between Deutsche Bank and, and Stonex, or INTL FC Stone as we were known then, and, and why Deutsche Bank used us for a, a, a wide range of currencies. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about the current correspondent banking model and, and the pitfalls inherent in it, and why the Stonex payment, global payments model, addresses many of those pitfalls. Um, and thirdly, I want to talk about why do financial institutions uh, choose to partner with Stonex for their payments to, to a number of markets, primarily um, the developing world markets, but not exclusively. And then finally, we'll touch on what, what we refer to as multi-beneficial scenarios about how uh, partnering with Stonex actually is to the benefit, we believe, of, of the entire payments chain. Um, so if we could, Jens, if we could move on to... to Thank you very much. It's a little small on my screen, but fortunately I have a copy to my side. So, so who are who are Stonex Global Payments? Well, if this uh, if today's if this morning's sessions are about new initiatives, we we're marginally cheating here because we we're we're less new and and more undiscovered. I think is probably a better way to to sum up um, the Stonex Global Payments. In fact, we've uh, the, the business was, was initiated in 1986 and for the first kind of 17 to 18 years was, was a moderately small um, outfit focused very much on aid and development flows to, to primarily the, the emerging developing markets. However, it was acquired by what has become the Stonex Group in 2004 and um, and uh, that led to a significant change in in the in the size of the organization and its reach and um we we've developed very much from there to to being 
what we believe is a, a moderately significant player in the uh, global cross-border space. And if we take something like McKinsey's global payments report from 2021, um, we're, if we're honest, slightly surprised by this stat, but in fact, um, McKinsey value the, um, the, the global cross-border um, payment space into various different segments. But in the B2B segment, um, Stonex Global Payments is actually responsible for about 1% of global cross-border revenues in, in B2B space, which for an organisation that may be unknown to many uh, participants today and to the wider markets it, it is moderately significant and, and something that we're, we ourselves are, are quite proud of. So how have we achieved that, that market share and that, that position? So, um, well, we've done this by being able to supply um, slightly north of 140 currencies um, and, and slightly over 180 countries. In fact, last week we, um, we, we advertised the fact or we announced the fact that we can now do cross-border payments directly onshore with a bank in Uzbekistan which is um, with a, a Sarka bank, and we're very proud of this fact. We, we believe we're the first financial institution to develop a local relationship in Uzbekistan, and it's been done in, with, with, the, uh, with the blessing of the, of the central bank and the understanding of the central bank there. And that's very much part of our, our business model. We like to work very carefully and, and closely with, with central banks in these markets because it helps us develop the, uh, the access to these markets in the most accurate fashion. So. And as our stats, hopefully people can see on the on the screen here, you know, we process over two billion dollars worth of transactions a month. We have the capacity to 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 handle significantly more. And we are we're used by a very wide range of financial institutions across the globe, including nine of the top 10 banks in the world by by FX market share. Um, so nearly every uh, large global transaction bank touches the Stonex uh, network either directly or indirectly but the vast majority of them directly and um, we have 350 around 350 correspondent banking relationships these 10 th these are almost exclusively onshore in-country correspondent banks that we're using to to process our, our payments and giving us access to to local market rates um, and we'll, we we um, also try predominantly where we can to work with local banks as opposed to the international the branches of international banks as we feel this puts us much closer to 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 the local market and is generally slightly more beneficial for the local market if the if the hard currency we are directing is going to to those local banks we're a full swift member and in fact we were the the first uh, party to to the first non-bank uh, institution to join the SWIFT GPI Global Payments Initiative. And the GPI initiative is something that's actually very close to our hearts at Stonex. We, we spoke uh, last year on the Central Bank Payments Conference in partnership with SWIFT about the Global Payments Initiative. And um, we, we feel strongly about it, not least for slightly selfish reasons, that we feel that the more that GPI is used, the more that our position in the market and our use by by all by several participants will become clearer to to the market and in fact swift themselves when we first approached them to become part of gpi weren't entirely sure who we were at first and they went away and did their own research on us and came back and i i think they were the slightly shocked to see that in fact um stonex were in fact number one in terms of number of local currency uh, payment instructions initiated from all UK bit codes in 60 different currencies. And I think from that moment onward, SWIFT realized that in fact, the stories we've been telling them were in fact true. And we were, we were fairly deeply embedded in the, uh, the cross-border global infrastructure. And we've had a very close relationship with them ever since. Um, and then lastly, you know, we have offices across the world we um, we have a, a 24, five and a half, uh, follow the follow the sun model, and and as stated, since the business started in in 1986, we have you know 
30 to 35 years of a very robust and deep local market knowledge in, in all, all the markets we serve. Jens, if we could flip, thank you very much. You're ahead of me, look at that. So, so what, is, what is the problem that Stonex Global Payments set out to, to, to fix? Well, I, I find it quite interesting listening to Victoria earlier that she also uh, primarily identified four different areas where current correspondent banking or um, has challenges. We, we call these actually the four main pillars of dissatisfaction, which might be uh, slightly over-egging it a little bit. But um, so we, we've broken these down into to uncertainty and risk, or, or in fact, in many ways, the risk inherent in, our, in uncertainty. If you're using traditional correspondent banking, if you're sending euros or dollars or equivalent cross-border where they're going to be converted, you know, the, 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 the uncertainties of how much do you need to send? How do you know you're being compliant with the local regulations? How do you know if you're, you're sending enough money? Uh, is there a danger you're sending too much money? And then, of course, there are there is the opaqueness in the system. Who's going to be handling your funds? Where are they sitting? Who's who are going to convert the funds at what stage? And I, we were thinking about an example here of potentially someone sending euros from Germany to to Indonesia. You know, the the it's possible that the bank in Indonesia may not even have a euro correspondent. Does that mean at some stage in that flow, the euros are going to get converted to dollars before they're going to get converted on onshore into local currency? And this is, you know, at, at this moment in time, still still a, 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 an opaque system. Then the, the third pillar is, is delays. How long does it take for funds to, to get across border? And, and is it possible that, uh, that documentation is, is, is required of funds being held somewhere? Um, and then lastly, the, the issue of deductions. Are, are there any hidden fees in the process? Uh, will more funds need to be sent to cover them? Uh, will deductions be made? Have we failed to, to, to fulfill the obligation that we were trying to complete by sending our funds in the first place? So Stonex tries to, to address these in each of these in, in their own ways. So firstly, we tried to bring certainty by giving upfront pricing, um, and guaranteed rates and um, use, using our understanding of local markets to, to, to ensure that we are making transactions that are complying with and understanding the local compliance regulations. We, uh, we give uh, transparent pricing based against benchmarks. Um, we use onshore banks in the local markets, which means that we can control the chain. Funds don't get stuck in, in, in the ether, so to speak. Uh, we give guaranteed timelines, again, by working with local banks in the local markets. We're able to ensure that funds arrive on time um, and uh, are supported. And more importantly, we understand prior to the transaction what supporting documentation may be needed. We're able to share that information with our customers. And lastly, and most importantly, in many cases, we're actually able to protect the principle of the transaction to ensure that there are no lifting fees. We do this by by connecting with local market infrastructure, we can control that payment process to ensure that the that the funds arrive whole. Jens, can we can we go forward to one more? Thank you very much. So, um, so why do our partner banks um, find uh, working with Stanex interesting? And, and 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 as we mentioned earlier, you know, nine of the top ten banks in the world, and um, in, indeed one of the largest central banks in Europe. Um, are, are daily customers of, of the Stonex Group. They find that turning on one partner can give them global coverage. It gives them access to onshore transparent pricing. It reduces their costs and risks as they don't need to run multiple relationships. They can de-risk the relationships and, 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 and run fewer nostros. They can take comfort that there are no hidden fees. There's no deductions. They can get certainty at the point of transaction. The whole thing connects via real-time API connectivity, and the, the 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 funds are delivered on time in a spot settlement uh, two-day um, window. And Jens, can we can we go to the to the last screen? So, um, 
who, who benefits from from the relationships that that Stonex have built and 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 our ability to make payments in these markets? Well, without wishing to repeat myself too much, obviously from the ordering customers' perspective, they um, get clear and transparent FX pricing at the point of transaction. The ordering institutions are able to significantly broaden the scope of currencies that they are able to to penetrate and provide to their customers. Um, uh, obviously, we have central banks as customers, as, as we've referenced, although many of them are actually indirect rather than direct. But also from a central bank perspective, because we tend, and this is more from the recipient side, because we tend to work exclusively with onshore banks, the um, onshore regulators could get a very clear picture of the funds that are coming into the local markets. And 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 the last um, point here on, on, on the, the current slide about the local banks is actually, I think, very relevant to central banks as well. Because we work with a panel of local banks, we're allowing those local banks to get access to the incoming flows and compete with each other so that we don't end up with concentration risk in any one market where one large international bank actually dominates the local market. And further, by bringing the local market pricing electronically to the to the rest of the world, we make that local market look a lot more transparent, a lot easier to do business in, and therefore more attractive for offshore players who, who are looking to do to business into markets that maybe have been slightly less difficult to, to penetrate from the outside. So that, that's the end of, uh, of our presentation. Jean-Michel, I'll turn over to you for any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Uh, listening to you, uh, a question came to my mind. Why are the Global Transaction Bank not doing what you are doing? Why do they are not able to use the existing correspondent banking relationships the way you are doing? Uh, it, it's a good question. I think that the answer to that question is, indeed, I think they are able to do it if they want to. But I think uh, somewhat unbelievably for an organization that many people haven't heard of actually it comes down to economies of scale we actually do this now for near as i said earlier for nearly every global bank and therefore it becomes um price efficient for us to be able to run relationships and all and multiple relationships in these markets so that we can bring robustness and transparency to our customers whereas for a single bank to do that that's kind of expensive to do these days they they for them, they can outsource to one to one stop shop that brings them maybe 60 markets rather than having to run 60 different relationships themselves. Uh, so I think it's a cost and efficiency thing. Okay, thank you, Greg. Uh, maybe another question. Uh, what is uh, Stonex expecting from uh, the central bank uh, community in this context of improving cross-border payments? Because cross-border payments improved might also be an advantage for you as an intermediary, as well as for your end customers, of course. Of course. I mean, I, I think we should be careful before we talk about expecting things because we, uh, we, we don't want to be seen to be demanding. But um, one of the things I think that one of the messages that we try to get across I th and, and sometimes struggle with a tiny bit with the central banks is there to be a greater understanding of the fact that in fact that there are increasing numbers of non-bank players who are actually very vital to the cross-border space you know as we've just talked about all of these global banks use an organization like stonex and yet still you know there are a number of markets around the world where the local regulations don't envisage a non-bank being involved in that process and and regulators don't always understand why the global banks and we talked Two years ago, Deutsche Bank presented with us, getting a central bank to understand in some markets why Deutsche Bank are using a non-bank like Stonex is, is one of the challenges. And, and I think that's one of the messages we'd like to send is, is the traditional method of just using banks for cross-border payments, I think, is is dying and, and, and some kind of further acknowledgement of understanding that where we sit in the chain it will, will be, a, for us, the most important thing. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Greg.